Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone present here on Zoom and in person. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Dylan Elegala. He will be speaking to us about taking global neurosurgery towards an academic discipline. Dr. Elegala completed his bachelor's in biological psychology, followed by his MD, which he graduated with honors from the University of Washington. He completed his neurosurgical residency from the University of Virginia, during which he also served as a senior registrar for a year in neurosurgery at the Auckland Hospital in New Zealand. Following this, he completed a cerebrovascular fellowship under Dr. Arthur Day at Brigham and Women's Hospital at the Harvard Medical School. With a career that spans two decades, he has served as an assistant professor of neurosurgery at Oregon Health and MUSC as the medical director of the Central Neuroscience Institute and as the chairman of the Department of Neurosciences at Lynchburg, Virginia. Along with serving as a founder and board member of a multitude of organizations, he currently is the medical director of Barrow Neurological Institutes Global. He has also received multiple awards for his work in the field of neurosurgical research and holds a patent for a modified ultrasound aspirator for use in and around vital structures of the body. His stellar publishing record includes 2,500 plus citations with an each index of 23. With this, I have the immense honor of welcoming our esteemed guest, Dr. Dylan Elegala. On behalf of the Department of Neurosurgery here at Mayo Clinic, Florida, we have a plaque prepared for you, sir, as a small token of our appreciation, which we will be sending across to you via mail. Thank you so much for being here. And at a personal level, uh, Dylan, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing, so I'll let you share. It was just an absolute pressure to be with you at the uh, Barrow Ball. That's where Dylan and I had the pleasure of connecting, reconnecting. And I saw the amount of work that he is leading on behalf of global neurosurgeons. So I felt that it was important for everybody to hear it. Just for, for you to plant to see this, these talks are not meant to be very long. They're meant to capture the imagination of everybody who's on the screen, everybody who is in that room and see if we can build more bridges with you, see if we can you know, get some of these residents to come in and spend time with you as you're doing work globally more than anything. So I thank you, you're an extraordinary person. I can tell that you have a, a very kind and given heart. I was able to experience that personally in my time with you at the Barrow, and I know how much Mike, Dr. Lawton, you know, uh, expresses his extraordinary, immense, uh, you know, appreciation for your work, as well as admiration for everything that you're doing, not only on behalf of the Barrow, but also on behalf of global neurosurgery and society in general. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you for being here with us. Well, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Q, Alfredo, and, and thank you uh, for the, the lovely introduction. You know, I, in, in these kinds of uh, visiting professorships and, and talks, I find that I I get so much more out of it than than I'm sure you will get from from my talks and my interactions this morning. Uh, and, and you know, when you're there in person, you get a feel for the energy of a program and a place and a hospital and the 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 people who make up the department. And I have to say, you've done a great job of uh, of translating that energy virtually with with your uh, with your uh, events the the first part of the morning. I, I I'm I'm particularly impressed with the amount of academic production that that uh, is coming out of your department. It's it's amazing, frankly. Uh, but even more so, I, I'm I'm really impressed with what you're doing with on the social media front. Uh, you know, it it really is the. Uh, I have to say, I have not been a uh, a, a, a an early adopter of it, but uh, it it is. Uh, the next frontier in academic uh, neurosurgery. Um, and so it's nice to see that it's being used in this way. So I'll, with that, I'll share my screen. Um, please let me know if you can see this. Yeah, we see it, Dylan, beautiful. Great. Great. So um, yeah, so again, uh, very honored to be here with you this morning. It's a little early here in Phoenix, but um, and I hope to be at some point, be there in person, see what you're what you've done uh, uh, and what what you're doing there uh, in Jacksonville. Um, so I, a little bit of my story, you heard um, from the introduction, uh, a little bit of my background, but you know, part of the nuance of this is um, I was really on the academic superhighway in, in the sense of my training. So 
when I went through my neurosurgical uh, training as a med student, uh, Dick Wynn was the chairman, uh, UVA trained. Everybody who came through that program went into academic neurosurgery. Um, I, I went on to do my residency, as you heard, uh, at the University of Virginia under Dr. John Jane. Uh, and there were some real giants in the field at that time, Ed Laws, Neil Cassell, uh, Ladislaw Steiner. Um, and, and it was a program that expected you to go into academic neurosurgery and ultimately to become a chairman of a program. And in fact, one of my co-residents did not go into academic neurosurgery, went into private practice, and his picture got taken off the wall. That, that was the, that in, in those days and at that place and in that time, that was the pressure to be an academician. Um, and, and as you heard also, uh, uh, Dr. Q, you, you probably uh, recognize the, the steps that this uh, photo is taken from at, at Harvard Medical School at the Brigham and had a, a wonderful experience with the Art Day during that time. Uh, and so finishing my re residency fellowship um, uh, I was set to go on to be uh, on the path to to uh, where where you're sitting right now, which is you know started as an assistant professor. Um, I had done some uh, novel work with micro bubbles and and uh, ultrasound. Um, uh, was set up for a KOA grant. Uh, I was about uh, I should have been setting up a lab and going on the academic pathway ultimately to have an, my own program. Um, and, and as I was uh, completing my fellowship, I, I, I actually didn't do that. I took a small detour. So instead of going uh, directly into, into my academic career, I, I decided to take some time off. Um, and uh, maybe it was what Dr. Fox was mentioning. Uh, I didn't get a chance to uh, uh, attend his breakfast session, but maybe it was burnout from the pre-88 hour work week uh, residency and fellowship programs. But I always wanted to go to Africa, just more for the sense of adventure than anything else. Um, I, through a, a series of of um, uh, serendipitous uh, uh, interactions, I found myself uh, at a remote hospital in North Central Tanzania. It's one of the main regional hospitals for uh, for the country, and and as I was telling. Uh, uh, people of what I was going to do, leaving for six months to, to spend time abroad, I started getting phone calls from all of my old mentors. Um, and these are, you know, giants of neurosurgery. And here I am, a young neurosurgeon just finishing. And really the bottom line is, what in the world are you doing? Uh, some of the things that they said is, you, you're going to ruin your academic career before you even start it. Um, your first two years after training are the most important. This is when you establish your practice and your lab. Uh, you're wasting your, your life. You cannot do this. The time to do this is when you're retired. And I heard that several times. Um, and uh, my prospective uh, employer said, I won't hire you if you do this. So at that time, this was unheard of. This is 2005, four, five, six, uh, absolutely unheard of. No, no one I knew directly out of their training did anything like this. Um, and, you know, this is circa 2005. Uh, there was no such thing called global neurosurgery at the time. It was called humanitarian neurosurgery or international neurosurgery. Um, there were a few breakfast sessions and lunch sessions on this topic, um, and it was sparsely attended. Um, and the pioneers in this field are really, Mervyn Wagen is the one who, who who um, laid the groundwork for this with years of work through fiends and, and going out to countries all over the world. Bob Dempsey, who's now the, the chair of, of the board of fiends, Paul Young, and, and many others. Um, but it, and, and fiends really changed some things in, in what was then humanitarian and, or international neurosurgery in that they, they introduced a training-based model. So rather than going and, and doing the work like, uh, like you've heard of with, um, the cleft palate work historically and other other uh, endeavors at that time, Fiend started to do training. Um, but volunteers were asked to do a trip report upon completion of a mission. 
it was mostly retired or later career neurosurgeons there at the time that I started uh, doing this work there was really nobody who was my age doing it um there are some notable exceptions Ben Wharf uh, spent as you everybody knows spent time in Uganda 6 years i believe uh Moody Qureshi who's who is a Kenyan um has spent a lot of time and, and lives in, uh, lives in, and uh, works in in Kenya but um those were some of the younger names in in neurosurgery and so, you know, when I when I thought about why were my mentors calling and saying, don't do this, you're ruining your academic career, I, I understood their point of view. This is what uh, international neurosurgery was. It was really a humanitarian endeavor. It, there, was n there were really very few publications. Um, nobody even thought about grants at that time in this, in this um, area. And and this what there there was no way to create an academic uh, career, um, but nomenclature. But I realized that for my six, first six months living and working overseas, um, that this is what I wanted to do. This is an area of neurosurgery. You know, as we're leading from the front of the Mayo Clinic, Jacksonville, or or the Barrow, or the Brigham, or UVA, or wherever we are in the U.S., we we really do have to realize. Um, to not let the rest of the world uh, lag behind. And there is a, a bit of a responsibility I felt that having the benefits of being in this country and being exposed to the best in the world, um, we, we've got a bit of a duty, especially people like me, who, who I was born in the developing world and was fortunate enough to, to grow up in the US, uh, to give back. And, but how do I do this? How do you do this as part of an organized academic approach? And that was the, the key question. And my first answer was nomenclature is important. You know, when you when you talk about it as humanitarian neurosurgery, that that clearly defines it as a non-academic uh, endeavor. And so in 2007, at one of the fiend, at my first Fiends board meeting, Mike Haglin, Roger Hartle, and I started uh, using the term global neurosurgery. Global health was really being discussed in non-neurosurgical uh, circles, um, and we we thought we need to first call it uh, something a little bit different that defines it in a space, not just in the humanitarian uh, zone. And so the vision that that um, that I the rudimentary vision I had back then was that patients would not have to leave their continent of origin to receive excellent care and that clinicians will not have to leave their continent of origin to leave excellent training. You know, the reality is that if we come to the US or to Europe to train, it's hard to go back. Um, uh, I, had a, I have a friend in Tanzania who's the, the leading physician in the country and he, he trained in Europe and in, in Singapore. And he said, you know, Delon, it's, it's kind of like um, training at the Cordon Bleu uh, and then going back to your home kitchen and not having the instruments, not having the ingredients to do the work you were trained for, and so you stop cooking, you you or you leave the country uh, to to go back to a place that has all the equipment and the, the the ingredients. And so this is a this is what neurosurgery looked like in Tanzania in two thousand six. Um, this is uh, camping headlights. This uh, this is me. This is Elisa Kusha, who's the first resident I took over, who was a, a Barrow resident back in 2007. And um, the key thing is we're not doing the case. We're, we're training this gentleman. And this gentleman is not an, a medical doctor. So he is an AMO, which is the equivalent of a PA or nurse practitioner. There were only two neurosurgeons in the entire country. Most of the hospitals in the country did not have Tanzanian MDs at the time. So this hospital was the main referral hospital for about a 7 million catchment area, uh, 450 beds, 600 to 700 patients, no local MDs. And so we started by training on MD because that's the best we had. So in six months, we, you know, we taught to do basic brain and spine surgery. And then went back and taught him how to teach. So uh, the following year, I went back for another year. And, and he taught the first local MD. They taught the next uh, local MD to do neurosurgery. And so these were the, the trainees back in 2006 to th up to 2010. Uh, we had students, medical students from the U.S. and local uh, trainees who kept outcomes data um, and 
you know, in order to do this kind of work, I thought, all right, we we do have to create an infrastructure around it. So just like the Dr. Q has done, uh, we created a nonprofit, Madaktari Africa, which means Doctors Africa and Swahili. Um, and the key is, if we want long-term programs, then we need long-term partnerships. So we built relationships with the government of Tanzania. We had contracts, MOUs with the government and with the hospitals that we were working with. Uh, we had an MOU with the uh, national research body uh, because we wanted to produce good quality data that we could publish upon for the long term. And what often happens in parts of the developing world is as leadership in the government changes, uh, you, you fall out of favor uh, and there's either less support or in in many cases, there's... Um, uh, you're you're forced to leave the country uh, because of the lack of support um, and and sometimes the hostility and so we wanted to make sure that we had a base for long term support for years and decades to come. Um, the nonprofits allow, allowed us to do the work because it indemnified all the volunteers and all the doctors and clinicians who went. Uh, it's very hard for an institution like the Barrow, or I would assume the Mayo Clinic as well, to do work overseas in countries. And so this is the uh, executing arm of, of uh, the project. We built REDCap uh, databases. We kept data from the first uh, case we did on. Um, and we published on this. Uh, so these this is some of the early publications and presentations we made. Uh, back back in 2008, 9, 10, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and, and interestingly, we also, um, uh, this also, we also looked at non-clinical, non-neurosurgical impact. We also looked at the financial impact of what we were doing in, and we were invited to give a presentation at the World Economic it was the first time that a neurosurgeon had spoken at that forum, uh, which I was interested in. Um, and knows that there is an audience for this kind of work outside of our own field. So once once I, once we once I spent those first few years doing this, the, the key question was, how do you actually transfer knowledge in the developing world in an efficient manner? And really, there's nothing that's been published on this, whether in global health circles or in the neurosurgical circles, um, comparing and contrasting different methods of training in the developing world. So we we looked at two models over the course of about five years. One we called the intensive one-to-one -one training model, where a single trainer spends a minimum of six months with one or two trainees living and working with them. The second um, uh, model is what we call the back-to-back -back model, where we had uh, clinicians from the US and Europe train overseas for two to four week blocks. And we tried to, as one end of their block, we tried to uh, bring in the next one. So there was all a near continuous, wasn't always the case, but a near continuous training with multiple trainers going for several weeks at a time. And this is much easier to do for those of us in clinical practice, um, it's hard to take six months or a year uh, to do this. It, it really is um, virtually impossible um, and, and maintain a career. Um, and so the results of this were just published uh, this month in the Red Journal. And what we found is that the one-to-one -one intensive training model works much better. There was uh, uh, better transfer of knowledge, longer lasting transfer of knowledge, uh, and Interestingly, the cost to do the program is much less. So, so a better utilization of resources with more effective approach. And so based on this, we did the first Global Neurosurgery Fellowship in 2012, where we had post-residency US neurosurgeons. So these are board eligible board cert or board certified. In this case, Janet Lee and Germa McConan had just finished their residencies. And before they went into their practices, they spent a year doing this, spending six months overseas in Tanzania. And what we found is it worked. Um, it was financially viable for our, the hospital system. Uh, it was uh, it had similar results to our early work. And so we now have a, a global neurosurgery fellowship program at the Barrow. Um, here are, is our first fellow, Dr. Kerry Vaughn, uh, uh, an amazing uh, young neurosurgeon. Uh, you 
Penn trained Toronto Sick Kids uh, uh, Pediatric Fellowship. And rather than going to practice immediately, she's she's doing another fellowship with us for a year. So three months are spent in Phoenix uh, and nine months in Tanzania. And she's actually just extended for another six months. Um, Eric Whitney had another career in, in uh, the business community, went back to medicine, a wonderful guy. Uh, he, he'll be joining us. And then Maria Punchak, another Penn uh, resident, is our 26-27 fellow. So if anybody's interested in 27-28, uh, love to have you involved. So you saw my my early career interest was in clinical cerebrovascular neurosurgery. And I, I want to take this as an example as the next step. So we 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 talked about and and we're publishing on what types of training works. The next question is how do you institute advanced neurosurgery into the developing world country and have the hospital, the patients, or the government the ministries of health afford the care. We barely can afford it here in the US. How is a poor country going to do this? Um, and it's important that we address this because the reality is that cerebrovascular disease is a huge burden in the developing world. This is a heat map of the incidence of ischemic stroke. Uh, and you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa has a high rate of ischemic stroke. And this is only going to grow in, in volume and number. Um, and, and if you can use ischemic stroke and cardiovascular disease as an indicator of uh, cerebrovascular disease as well. And so this is a, a, a map or uh, a chart of the distribution of the workforce as compared to the disease burden. And what this shows is, in, is that in the US and Europe, there is a high percent of global healthcare workers and a low burden of disease, whereas in Africa, it's a low number of healthcare workers and a high burden of disease. And what this is indicative of is the fact that they can't afford to hire healthcare workers. If you can't afford healthcare workers, the numbers are gonna be low. And it's in the areas of the world that most need it that this is an issue. And this is another graph that compares country wealth uh, by disease burden. And it's a little bit of a complicated chart, but I'm gonna give you the bottom line. And the bottom line is that as a country increases in wealth, the burden of disease shifts from communicable diseases like diarrhea and malaria and upper respiratory infections to non-communicable diseases like stroke and ischemic heart disease. Uh, and, and this makes sense. And as a country increases in wealth, the burden of infectious disease actually goes down. And, and if we think about it, this really does make sense because if your country is wealthier and now the salaries and the national gross national income per, per citizen goes up, it's easy to buy bed nets. It's easy to buy fuel to boil your water and, and um, uh, destroy the parasites and reduce the incidence of communicable diseases but you still might not be able to afford the stents or the coils to treat ischemic stroke or to treat uh, aneurysmal uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so when and how do you institute higher level specialty care into a country that is somewhere on this spectrum of uh, wealth? So the good news is in a country like Tanzania, the GDP is increasing. So this is uh, the GDP of Tanzania in 2005, which is 18.4 billion, it's increased to 62 billion in 2020, and we expect this to increase. So it is it is uh, getting better. The downside is the population is growing even faster. So in 2005, when I first went, there were 42 million people in the country. Uh, when I just got back two months ago from Tanzania, the population is. 62 million, and it's expected to rise to 150 million by 2050. Five uh, of the highest um, population countries uh, will be in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the next five years. And so even though GDP is in increasing, the population is growing at a, at a higher pace than what the country is probably going to be able to keep up with. Along with that, with the westernization of diets, non-communicable diseases are really coming to the fore. And so 
in the, in the case of cerebrovascular disease, what do we do? Well, in 2005, we were training non-MDs just to do basic surgery, uh, basic neurosurgery. The government could not certainly not afford uh, a high-end operating theater with operating microscopes or endovascular angio suites. They, they probably can at this point. So when we look at the cost of aneurysmal uh, uh, treatment, the gross national income per capita in Tanzania is about $1,200. So that's how much a, a, a typical person can uh, expect. This is not actually wages. Wages are even lower. Um, but it gives you an idea of the ability of a country to afford high-end healthcare. And if you look at coil uh, clipping of aneurysms, uh, this is what it costs in India. And most medical supplies are sourced from India and Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's about $4,000 for coiling of an aneurysm. Uh, sorry, for clipping of an aneurysm. For coiling of an aneurysm, it's double or triple that. It's about ten to eleven thousand uh, dollars. So you can see that coiling is going to be extremely hard for the country as a whole to afford at volume, or for individual patients to afford. And so the next thing that we're looking at is how do we have a graded graduated approach to implementing advanced neurosurgical care into a developing world country. Well, if it's a low income country, you probably aren't going to be able to do uh, surgical or endovascular care. You're really going to have focus on proper diagnosis, uh, medical treatment if possible. Um, it, after a country's GDP increases and now they're a middle income country or a low middle income country like Tanzania is, the best thing to institute is probably open surgical cerebrovascular care, so clipping of aneurysms. Um, and then once the GDP increases even more, you can now institute both open and uh, endovascular care, uh, just like we do in the West. And so what we're looking at currently is we're working with Thunderbird School of Global Management in uh, Phoenix, the number one global management school in the U.S., to look at GDP and cutoffs at what point can a country as a whole afford certain levels of healthcare and training that's appropriate for what a country can afford. Because we what we've observed is when in the country can't afford seeing the equipment from time to time um, or or we do the training and it's lost because they can't uh, the patients can't afford it. So now let's target our training to the ability of the government and the, and the patients to afford the, the care that we're uh, providing or training. So our as uh, so we have started a Barrow Global uh, program. Our first site we've uh, chosen as Kilimanjaro Christian Medical School uh, Center. It's uh, in northern Tanzania at the foot of Kilimanjaro. Um, the reason we chose it is it had never had neurosurgery before, but it's the main zonal hospital, the government hospital, a million people. Prior to our this program being in, uh, implemented, there were no neurosurgeons there. So 18 months ago, they hired uh, Dr. Rabiel, the chief of neurosurgery, the first local neurosurgeon. So that's our first intervention. No neurosurgery. What happens after a local neurosurgeon is, is, uh, is, uh, has started. The second intervention is having a Western trainer, and that's our first fellow, Dr. Vaughn. Uh, and being the BNI, her first weekend was climbing a mountain here. Um, and so uh, she started in May. And our next intervention is going to be this. So we, uh, Zeiss has donated uh, a, a microscope. We're uh, we're now doing um, uh, endoscopic surgery there. Uh, the hospital has come in. So partnership and long-term program building is key. And so we've worked with the government of Tanzania and with the hospital. The hospital the, the hospital is investing and the government is investing almost two and a half million dollars to build out new neurosurgical operating theaters, neuro ICU and ward, um, specifically for this program. And this really this is a huge amount of money in, in Tanzania. Um, it doesn't seem like much for us here in the US, but this is enormous sum. And it just speaks to the importance of having long-term relationships and uh, in order to build a long program. Um, and so the third intervention is once this is completed, 
having the Dr. Lawton's, the Juan Uribe's, the, the Dr. Uh, the, the subspecialty experts now go in and train our, our list open supervisor clipping because the, the country's GDP is not quite there yet to be able to afford a sustainable supply chain brand of asteroid coiling. Uh, and then once the GDP gets to the cutoff that uh, we're assessing right now, we'll start to implement endovascular care as well, along with a sustainable supply chain uh, uh, source through the government. So even though much of the developing world doesn't look like this or the those beautiful video of the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, uh, my hope is that over the next coming years and decades, we will get close along with having a global neurosurgery division at each major leading U.S. neurosurgical center with dedicated academic faculty doing research, uh, publishing in the field of global neurosurgery, just like any other subspecialty of neurosurgery. So thank you very much for uh, letting me talk, and uh, I hope this was uh, worthwhile. Dylan, beautiful, beautiful talk. And I just want you to know, I think that uh, Juan Pablo, do you want to tell Dr. Eligala how many people we had joining from and how many different countries so he gets a sense of who was here in this? Absolutely, sir. So this morning we have uh, over 20 attendees in person and 60 virtual participants from nine different countries, including Argentina, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Spain, Mexico, Italy, Panama, Japan, and multiple states in the U.S. Thank you, sir. Wonderful talk. One, Thank that's amazing. You, Beautiful. And I see Dr. Miller. I'm going to pivot to him. And I mean, I just want to put it in perspective because I think that Dr. Eligala said it beautifully and eloquently as to the why, right? And that Dr. Keith Park, who's been a, a really strong advocate of this kind of international endeavors and academically uh, at the level of Dr. Eligala, you know, just taking it to the next level, wrote a paper a couple of years ago in the Journal of Neurosurgery, JNS, where they look at the data. And it is estimated that about 5 million people a year in the world are in need of some sort of neurosurgical care. And they are unfortunately dying from, and this is not complex neurosurgical care. These are subdural. These are brain uh, traumas, uh, spinal cord injuries, and stuff like that. And unfortunately, we have a shortage. So he estimated with his colleagues in a very rigorous way that we need about 23,000 neurosurgeons to be able to supply that demand globally. We do have a shortage of neurosurgeons even here in the United States right now. So I think that that put it in perspective and that also tells you why, you know, this work that Dylan is doing is so crucial. And I was paying attention, Dylan, to what you're doing. You know, not only do we have fellows from other parts of the world coming to join us and learn from us, but you're also sending the fellows, our fellows, our next generation to other parts of the world to create that exchange that it is absolutely crucial, you know. So having said that, I mean, I just wanted to put it in perspective and I'm going to pivot to uh, Dr. Miller. Dave Miller is an extraordinarily leader also in neurointerventional neurosurgery. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Dr. Ilada. It was a, a, a fascinating and fantastic talk, um, and I congratulate you on. I really, I mean, you know, look, everybody else has said, but I congratulate you on wonderful work. For me, cerebrovascular obviously is, is is a is a tremendous interest of mine, um, and I I have always wanted to do more on an international level. One of the things that has always stopped me is that is is what you touched on towards the end the the infrastructure and the investment needed to do the complex stuff that I do uh, is not available not even uh, possible in many parts of the world that that need this and and that I would you know aspire to go to I'm really really interested in the fact that you're trying to do that where you're doing it I think it's a, it's a, it's fascinating and it's uh, it's extremely interesting how are how do you feel I mean how do you do you expect to be able to to um to sustain an income stream or a supply chain stream, you know, as you talked about, things are politically unstable. Things go back and forth. How do you, you know, once you get a program like that started, it it, it was such such an investment. You'd hate to have it sputter, stop, start. How do you plan on on, on sustaining these kinds of things through through all the different changes that you see in these countries? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and, and set of questions actually. And and so let me let me try and answer that. And, and before I answer your question, let me, uh, Dr. Q, one of the things you just mentioned, there's a great study published that shows that if young clinicians have early exposure to uh, uh, international health in areas of profound need, they're more likely to spend their careers in areas of need in the U.S. And so it is important to have early exposure to these kinds of um, settings, I think. Uh, Dr. Miller, to answer your question, so um, part of what um, uh, I've done and my, or my nonprofit has done in East Africa is we've expanded our models beyond neurosurgery. So, so Madaktari Africa, the nonprofit, has actually implemented these same uh, training programs in in car in cardiac disease, in general surgery, anesthesia, primary care. Uh, we had programs in each of the major zonal hospitals in the country. We were, were are part of the Ministry of Health, um, and so we've learned not just from what we've done in neurosurgery, but from other disciplines as well. And one of the things is we need to partner and work together with other clinical specialties. So, for example, um, we were heavily involved in setting up and training the clinicians at the main cardiac institute in Tanzania uh, called JKCI. And so they have endo, endo uh, vascular coronary uh, care. And so I think one of the ways to do this is rather than setting up a purely neurosurgical endovascular institute or, or, or uh, center is to partner with the cardiac um, catheterization labs uh, and rather than duplicate the the rooms and the device, the machines and everything else, we can actually use the rooms when uh, uh, share the rooms basically to share the equipment um, uh, to start doing endovascular care earlier than if we were waiting to put in place a full neuro endovascular suite, which would take a lot of time and cost uh, uh, be cost prohibitive. Um, uh, so that's one way is to share with other specialties um, the equipment and the rooms. Um, the other the other is we really do have to help the government um, develop sustainable supply chains. So and that's one of the things that we're doing. So we've worked with the ministry that handles supply medical supplies for the country uh, to source lower cost equipment from India and East Asia. Um, uh, um, however, uh, my suspicion is, and, and Thunderbird will verify this, that is that the government of Tanzania still probably cannot afford um, uh, a high volume of endovascular care. And so we probably are five years away from being able to do endovascular uh, treatment in a country like Tanzania. Um, but, you know, it, it will come. These countries are developing fast. No, that's that, th thank you for for the explanation. It's wonderful. Uh, so uh, so come find me in five years. I'll be retiring. I'll be happy to go help you do what you're doing. <laughs> Fantastic. And actually, if you would, if you're interested, we would love for you to help us develop the plan for going in with endovascular care now. And and part of this is if you are if you do have a week or ten days, come see the site, meet the 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 folks who would be developing this in country, because it is those relationships that build over time that make all this possible. Um, and you'll get an idea even now of what you, how you would want to do it five years from now. And, and we can build towards that starting now. So please, if you'd like, let's, let's start now. I would love to. I'll talk to you. All right. Dylan, Sorry. one question just to follow. I think uh, Chris, actually, Chris, and then I want to have another quick question. Go ahead, Chris. Great. Yeah, Dylan, thanks so much. That was an awesome talk. Very inspiring. It's uh, perfect for a Monday morning. Um, it's the opposite of like having to start off the week with neurosurgery m and or something. You know, you just want to like run out of the gates and go start helping people. So I really applaud you for what you've done. Um, truly amazing. I, I'm just curious, how, how do you set it up? Uh, and forgive me if I miss this, but, um, you know, with your own personal schedule and the demands put on, on us, um, you know, by factors that are often out of our control and lots of economic demands. How, how do you set it up so you can be away and dedicate time to this? Um, and obviously, you know, your leadership is huge and without it, everything would probably 
you know, fall apart. But so how, how do you manage that with, with the barrel, with your partners, with your practice? What, what's, what's your plan for them? What recommendations do you have for, for our yeah. team? Yeah. Box, that, that's a, that's a great question. And the, the real answer is uh, I couldn't, there, there was no way to do it uh, up to now. Um, so I actually quit academics um, uh, in order to do this. Uh, I, I did, I couldn't get the support of my, uh, of my uh, department or even the university and, and understandably so, you know, it's a, it's a, it, the reality is that this is also a business and it's hard for a department to, to run profitably when uh, a major faculty member is gone for half the year. Um, so, so I actually quit academia. I left for a period of time um, uh, to provide myself the financial resources in order to be able to do this. Um, so, uh, and I've come, I come back because Mike Lawton is a visionary uh, leader, has sees the value in this, sees the future of this as an academic discipline. Um, and so we're right now in the process of developing a dedicated global nurse academic track uh, where the faculty will spend half the year doing clinical work here in the US and half the year doing global work at our international sites um, and doing academic work. And it's really structured very similar to a, a typical academic neurosurgeon's um, uh, 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 path. The, the problem is if you're if you're doing re, uh, if you have your own research lab you can spend four days of the week doing clinical work and a day in your lab overseeing it that's hard to do when your lab is halfway around the world um, and so what we're creating is a six month six month track with um, uh, two neurosurgeons basically job sharing and I and we're going to institute that starting in January Dr Vaughn our fellow uh, and I will be the first two to pilot this, and we expect to have four uh, full-time global faculty uh, by 28. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. That's really helpful to know. And it's uh, you know, I, again, just congratulate you and and also uh, the BNI and and Dr. Lawton and everyone who's supported this because um, I agree with you. I think it's incredibly important. Um, I think it's will become increasingly important for hospital systems to recognize that. Um, you know, these sort of uh, things that make us better neurosurgeons, better physicians, more well-rounded people, more engaged in the world rather than just, you know, a cog in the wheel of corporate medicine. Um, you know, that that's what's going to help medicine survive in the long term for the way that patients want it. So um, and you guys are really leading the charge and and, and uh, it's really, it's wonderful to see. Well, and, you know, the, and, and the reality is we're doctors aren't doctors for a country. Uh, we're doctors for humanity, um, and the the neediest patients are often not in our own backyards. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I I totally agree with you. And this this is a conversation that um, you know, we 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 could go on for quite a while. But I mean, I agree. I think um, you know, the way that medicine has become in many ways, we we're in danger of losing sight. Uh, you know, why so many of us went into medicine um, in, in the first place. Um, and it can't just be a transactional um, experience uh, for for the neurosurgeon or the patient. Um, and uh, I think as as healthcare becomes increasingly, um, uh, you know, a commodity and corporatized, um, we're we're in risk of uh, of losing that. And and I think it's the key is to have visionary leaders like you have there with uh, Alfredo, and like I, I'm fortunate to have here with uh, Mike Lawton. So it's it's the the chairs of the departments are are the keys to this. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Chris and, and Dr. Miller and everybody. I mean, as you can see, Dylan, there's a tremendous interest and you're absolutely right. We have to change. The world is created frontiers, barriers, fences. You know, um, they don't exist. Our brain, you have a neuron migrating from the ventricular zone all the way to the occipital horn from the interior portion of the ventricular. They don't exist. You know, we have created them. Our own brains have created. In medicine, we were meant to serve humanity. As you said, I love what you just said right now, because we don't affiliate with one party or the other. At the end of the day, we are here to serve those who need us the most. And I think that your work is inspirational for me. It makes me feel like I need to do more. 
I really do, you know, and I go back to what Chris, you know, said, how do you do it? At I, I got to tell you, I mean, with Mike and I and George and Ted and a lot of people, we have been taking our vacation time to do a lot of this, you know, work and, and going out there and, 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 and helping more than anything, learning, to be honest with you. We always have this discipline. We're not there to do. And I love the, the picture that you showed where you are there helping. You are there to learn. And if they allow you to share your knowledge, because at the end of the day, you have to create that sustainability on the long run. And it's beautiful, inspirational, every picture. I love what you're doing with the fellows. And I want to make sure that we are committed to you through Mission Brain, to our own foundation, through resources that we are accumulating over the years to make sure that we partner to help these extraordinary efforts. You know, So that's what I wanted to make sure that people heard. And maybe some of our residents will want to, begin to apply to one of these fellowships in the years to come, you know, and uh, and then we're also looking forward to having you here in person. I love to organize a global, just like what we did at the Barrow. Maybe we do one here at May. How is that? I, I would love to, I would love that. I would love to be involved and honored to be associated in any way. And I, I will tell you for your residents and students, um, we have publications and research um, uh, going on right now in global neurosurgery, as as you do with Mission Brain, um, but maybe you know if anyone's interested, we'd love to have um, a collaboration where we have co-authorship and and mm -hmm. grants together in this field. So, you know, there's 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 not many of us doing this work, and so the ones who are like uh, your department and ours, let's uh, let's join forces to make it stronger. We're going to have to. I think that there are grants through the Gates Foundation, the Zuckerberg Foundation, the NCI, the federal government. Just today, we're doing a global meeting for some of these grants that are available. That I can help with because I know how to write grants and I have been able to crack the code, you know, for a number of years. So we can definitely do something. So I like challenges for two action items. Number one, a global meeting here. And you see Juan Pablo, Emiliano, Paolo are going to follow. Number two, to look at some of the major grants and how we unite your foundation and our foundation and be able to happen because that's the only way that this is going to happen. So wonderful, wonderful. So those are the action items that I put in our team. So Emiliano, what's, I know that, that we have meetings uh, with Dr. Elegala. So what, what what does it look like for the yes, rest sir. of the morning for him? Dr. Elegala is meeting the neurosurgery residents up until 8.30, 8.30 to 9, meeting the consultants and 9 to 9.30, Dr. Elegala is going to meet with the research fellows. Beautiful, beautiful. So that way, thank you. Thank you Dylan, for dedicating your morning, your time more. But I think that this is going to pay out. We already have some action items that we're going to follow through. I love it. All right. Well, you have another link to join the residents. They're waiting for you. And I have a great day. And we're going to continue to talk. All right. You as well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.